Let's now talk about another challenge posed by information asymmetry, uh, namely moral hazard. So to explain, you know, let's think back to the market for lemons real quick. Uh, when we had these sellers that had either a bad car or a good car and the buyers who didn't have information about which cars were good and which cars were bad. Now, if you think about a seller of a bad car in the market for lemons, it's not like that was a bad person. They just owned a bad car. I mean, if that person could have snapped their fingers and turned their bad car into a good one, they would have happily done it. And so adverse selection in its purest form, like in the market for lemons, uh, really the problem is not that anyone's acting in a way that you don't want them to. The problem is really just missing information from the market. Thinking about various online marketplaces, however, you know, like say Amazon and eBay, you know, we see that actually probably adverse selection is not the biggest concern, the biggest uh, problem that's being faced by the reputation system, right? So in, in eBay, for example, uh, it's not so much that you think that some of the sellers are intrinsically less capable of carrying out a transaction than others. Uh, you're more worried that uh, a seller is going to rip off a buyer. So get the buyer's payment and either never send uh, whatever was purchased or send some inferior version, uh, etc. So we're really concerned, you know, less about the quality of a seller, intrinsic quality, and we're much more concerned about the action that they're going to take. So this is a different form of information asymmetry where you have lack of information about an action rather than about quality, and it has its own name, and that name is moral hazard. Moral hazard basically refers to an incentive to take an action that would be harmful to others. Uh, or a bit more formally, uh, it's really when you have an action where the cost of that action is not fully borne by the decision maker. It's borne at least partially by others. Moral hazard can be viewed as a type of information asymmetry uh, in which the decision maker knows more about what action she will take than anybody else. Let's see how moral hazard can come up in some of our running examples. Uh, and let's begin by going back to the market for health insurance policies. When we first talked about the health insurance market, we, we talked about individuals as if they had some given and immutable level of health. Uh, but of course, your actions can affect your health. And if you think about an individual with no health insurance, okay, so meaning they're not going to get any of their medical expenses reimbursed, they have a strong incentive to keep their medical expenses as low as possible. That is, they have an incentive to exert extra effort to stay as healthy as possible. Whereas if some chunk of your medical expenses are not borne by you, if they're borne by a health insurance company instead, that reduces the incentive for you to be as healthy as possible. Similarly, in the labor market, we were talking about workers as if they were born into the world, you know, with a certain productivity level. Um, you know, but of course, you can take actions to make yourself more or less productive, depending on how much effort you exert. And so here, if you have a worker at a firm and uh, if, you know, their effort cannot be directly observed, so if you can't condition the wage of a worker on how much effort they exert, if their wage is independent of their effort, then they're not incentivized to exert as much effort as would be good for the firm. So here again, we have asymmetric information where only the worker knows uh, how much effort they're putting in and the, uh, the firm deciding the compensation uh, does not. So as a result, they're likely to put in less effort and then that causes a cost which is borne uh, not so much by the individual, but more by the firm. And that's what makes a moral hazard. Finally, in an online platform like eBay, the moral hazard, hazard problem faced by a seller is whether or not to rip off a buyer after the seller has received that buyer's payment. And so, you know, absent some future karmic retribution for the seller ripping off the buyer, ripping them off has consequences for the buyer. Okay, so it's an action by the seller with consequences for the buyer. So that makes it moral hazard. As with adverse selection, if the issue is a, uh, asymmetric information, you know, the, the obvious approach to make it better is to try to reduce uh, the asymmetry in information. So in this case, it's about an action. So we have someone taking an action which is not observed. So we want to expose as much information as possible about what that action is likely to be. For example, what the same individual, what action they took in the past uh, in similar contexts. And that is exactly now the primary purpose of a reputation system uh, in a platform like Amazon or eBay. You're exposing information about what, say, a seller has done in the past that reduces the amount of asymmetric information about what the seller is likely to do uh, and therefore gives us a safer and more efficient market. 
Now, I don't mean to suggest that, you know, adverse selection and moral hazard, that they're sort of, you know, mutually exclusive things. <clears throat> and indeed, you know, many scenarios exhibit a blend of the two. So just, you know, as one example, think about the reputation system in, say, Airbnb. Okay? On the one hand, it does mitigate adverse selection, you know, just like in our restaurant example, uh, through reviews of sellers. So without this information, you know, sellers, meaning the, the renters, the owners of the spare rooms, the sellers would be much more informed about the quality of the co accommodations that they're offering than the buyers. So it's the reviews that really expose the information about uh, the quality of the spare rooms to the buyers. On the other hand, Airbnb's reputation system also mitigates some moral hazard problems. So for example, you know, if some renters throw a party and trash the apartment they rented, uh, then they'll be rewarded, you know, they'll lose the security deposit, but then they'll also be rewarded with a negative review and maybe refused service by other sellers in the future. So it does enable a sort of uh, karmic retribution for parties that, uh, that misbehave. And so this now ties the topics of this module, asymmetric information, adverse selection, moral hazard, uh, ties them together with our sort of overarching narrative of understanding how the role that incentives play in, in the platforms that we use uh, every day. So we've seen that adverse selection and moral hazard are both common in markets, including in online marketplaces. And now we understand that, you know, probably the primary role of a reputation system in one of these platforms is to mitigate one or both of these. Okay, so possibly to expose more information about quality, uh, to mitigate adverse selection, and or to expose more information about the actions uh, that participants are likely to take, thereby reducing the moral hazard problem uh, by introducing a lever for karmic retribution, where bad actions taken now can be punished uh, in the future, very much in the spirit of our uh, repeated prisoner's dilemma discussion uh, in module number two. So the last thing I want to do in this module number three is I want to sort of take this reputation systems uh, thread and run with it and dive a little bit deeper into the reputation system at eBay and how it's evolved over the years. So that's coming up next.